My name is Emily, and I'm currently 39 years old. I work in the research department of a pharmaceutical company. My husband, Jeff, is the same age as me. We were classmates in college and started dating back then, eventually getting married when we were 27. We don't have any children. The fact that we're childless has caused some tension in our relationship for quite a long time. After we got married, things were fine for a while since we were just continuing our relationship. But around the second year, when I was about to turn 29, things started to get a bit strained. It all began with a holiday greeting card from my in-laws. Do you have kids yet? It had a message written by my mill, Sarah. What was with that holiday greeting card, anyway? When I guessed that, Sarah was subtly inquiring in her message. Children are a blessing, so it would be great if you could have one. Jeff started saying, but we should really have one soon, right? Well, I was open to the idea of having kids. But Jeff began repeating it, just because I guess he was prompted by his parents. Then, the do you have kids, yet, comments from my in-laws didn't just stay in the holiday greeting cards. They started saying it to us in person whenever we met. And it didn't stop there. They began with superstitious beliefs, like, wearing red underwear supposedly helps in conceiving, and even gave it to us with instructions. Other than that, red beans paste are supposed to be good for fertility, and they sent us a bunch of dried red beans. The superstitions escalated to things like, our neighbor got pregnant, so I got some rice from her. Eating the same food as a pregnant woman is sure to have positive effects, and they'd bring the actual item. It was like turning to superstitions when in trouble. Well, at the fourth year of our marriage, when I turned 31, Jeff and his parents became more anxious and the superstitions intensified. My mill, Sarah, even started making phone calls, asking, are you sure wearing the red underwear? I just gave non-committal answers to appease her. In reality, I tried it just once according to the instructions, and it felt so odd and uncomfortable that I stopped especially since it was affecting my work. Each year, their holiday greeting cards would carry more frustrated messages, like, enough is enough, we want to see a grandchild. They'd also mail us a fertility charm after attending the church worship service. Jeff even jokes, is there a poverty spirit or whatever haunting your womb? A poverty spirit, haunting my womb, that's too powerful. In disbelief at these ridiculous notions, I'd respond, don't be silly, I'm getting my period regularly. But Jeff would seriously suggest that maybe there was some sort of womb bad luck causing the issue. At this point, I felt compelled to start fertility treatments Many couples hesitate to pursue this due to the fear of straining the relationship if a problem is found with other partner. But we were already strained due to those bizarre superstitions. So that was our plan to start fertility treatments in an effort to smooth our relationship. And we got the results. It turned out that the issue was not something that could be fixed with superstitions. Jeff was infertile. 
However, I had no intention of divorcing him over this. I just hoped this would put an end to the ridiculous superstitions and accusations. Nevertheless, looking at the test results, Jeff just said, There are things in this world that science can't explain, like the Nazca lines. After all, infertility is usually the wife's fault, right? That must be explaining why there are beliefs like eating the same food as a pregnant woman for fertility. What? So, it's more than half your fault, then? What the hell are you? I was utterly speechless. If Jeff could dismiss the test results, it was no surprise that his superstition-believing parents did the same. Just as I supposed, Saru even said, if these results were accurate, there wouldn't be legends like the red underwear or fertility food. Furthermore, my Phil, Jack, concluded with, it's an ancient belief that infertility is the wife's fault. They say the egg chooses the sperm. You should listen to your womb. What's the point of the tests then? What does he mean by the voice of the womb? The only thing my womb says is a monthly cramps. The strained relationship between Jeff and me remained unresolved. According to Jeff's reasoning, it goes like this. My fault number one, I don't wear the red underwear. My fault number two, I get my period every month. My fault number three, I supposedly lack the passion for having children. His only fault, the results of the fertility test. So, apparently, it's three to one against me as the cause of our infertility. This is so absurd that I had to speak up. Hold on a minute. This lack of passion for having kids, I do want them, isn't undergoing fertility treatments proof enough of that, and how is it my fault that I get my period every month? But he's in yielding, that's the thing, if a woman doesn't want to get pregnant, it just doesn't stop. Don't you get it? And then he says, if you really wish for it, you can overturn science. Remember our neighbor, Smith. He was given three years to live but has survived over five. Working in a pharmaceutical company, don't you understand this? This really got under my skin. I work on research to cure headaches at a pharmaceutical company. I'm trying to develop a drug that's less harsh on the stomach, and how can he dismiss my noble research like this? It felt like he was not only dismissing my work, but also denying my very humanity. In the midst of all this, he says things like, there's no point in living with a woman who doesn't want kids, and maybe it's just our luck that we can't have kids. Referring to my in-laws, they were no better. They say, if we knew she was unlucky in childbearing, we wouldn't have allowed their marriage, and maybe it's beyond just luck or misfortune. Perhaps an evil spirit has possessed her. With my in-laws being like this, it's a downward spiral with Jeff's feelings drifting further away. Eventually, he started coming home late and spending weekends away. Then one day, I need to talk to you. He comes up to me and says, Turns out, you were the cause of our infertility. I had a hunch where this was going. My in-laws had started blaming me as possessed by an evil spirit for the ineffectiveness of their superstitions, and the way Jeff looked at me had changed just like them. 
I saw it coming, and he continued. You don't have the determination to bear a child, so I lost interest in you. That led me to get close to a 25-year-old girl who started working at my company. She wanted me more than you did, and guess what, she's pregnant now. So, I'm choosing the woman who has stronger feelings for me. I'm going to be with her and respond to her feelings. Well, that was all I could muster in a robotic-like response. Getting pregnant just because of feelings, that's not how it works. I told him, well, congratulations or whatever. But you know, having a child with a woman you cheated with is definitely going to look bad. I'll be expecting a fair amount of alimony, just so you know. But he retorted, even the way you say that reeks of infertility. If you had been as devoted to me as she is, this wouldn't have happened. Just disappear from my life, carrying that evil with you. Then he said, I'm moving into a love nest with her, so you can stay here all alone, and left the house. Alone? Fine by me. I'll enjoy my single life, possessed by an evil force. I'll tame it and cuddle with it. At this point, I had lost all feelings for Jeff. The infertility issue was revealed to be his fault through the test results, so being blamed for it, accused of lacking passion or being cursed, was just too much. I felt relieved that this life of being unjustly blamed and looked down upon was finally ending. I got another woman pregnant. I overheard him excitedly calling his parents, telling them everything. He spoke confidently on speakerphone. Wow, congratulations. It must have been the difference in passion and desire for a child. You must feel liberated from that curse now. His mother replied, seemingly thrilled to pin all the past misfortunes on me. Within a few days, he packed his stuff and left with a triumphant air. The next day, I sent the fertility test results to my in-laws as a parting gift. Fast forward a few years later. I was enjoying a peaceful Saturday morning, having finished cleaning up and sipping tea in my spotless living room. With some delicious chocolate, and the mist from my aromatherapy humidifier. I was embracing the best relaxation time. That's when my rarely used phone rang. Who could it be during such a chill afternoon? It's Sarah, my ex-mill. What now? I answered the phone hesitantly. Help me, please, she cried out frantically without knowing what she's referring to. As I remained silent, she continued in a frenzied tone. The baby is definitely not my son's. I mean, she has blonde hair and blue eyes. I nearly spat out mighty, laughing when I heard this. I had sent a copy of the fertility test results to my in-laws to show them that their son was infertile, but I didn't expect such an obvious outcome. There's nothing I can do for you, we're divorced, after all. I replied, brushing her off. Don't be so cold. You were part of our family, that means something, right? What kind of connection is that, anyway? I should have just ignored her, but I was curious to see the chaos firsthand, so I decided to visit them the next day. I also had a few things I wanted to say. When I arrived at their house, Jeff, his parents, and his second wife were all there. 
His new wife wouldn't even make eye contact with me. Not surprising, considering I took a fair amount of alimony from her in the divorce. Her name was Megan, if I remember correctly. She might be considered cute by some standards. As soon as I got there, Sarah began to rant. The child she gave birth to belongs to a total stranger. We supported them wholeheartedly. We even went on a pilgrimage to ensure a healthy baby. She fumed. I didn't ask for any of that. And you just used it as an excuse for a lavish trip, didn't you? Megan snapped back. Enough, both of you. Anyway, it's clear the child isn't my sins. Jack tried to mediate without any meaning. I couldn't help but laugh. Why am I even here? It's obvious the child isn't mine either. It's about money. You are where it all started. So we called you, Sari accused me loudly. It's because you extorted alimony from us. Megan added, directing her anger at me. Then she turned to Jeff, yelling, This guy lied about his salary when we started dating, twice as much. If I knew he earned so little, I never would have married him. I don't want to raise a child that's not mine. And you, always nagging about money, Jeff lost his temper too. And they all teamed up and laid blame on me. It's all because you took the alimony. I scoffed at their behavior. If you're blaming your troubles on the alimony I received, then the root cause that forced you to pay it, what on earth was it? Ah, they all shrank back, clearly hitting a nerve. This guy, who faked his income to impress a younger woman, and you, who got blinded by money and cheated with another man, when it boils down, you're completely responsible for your own mess. They all fell silent at my words. I urged Megan. So, who's the father, really? Since money seems to be your only concern, you might as well confess. She muttered, someone in the military. I don't know who. Who's someone, anyway? This is San Diego. There's a military base here, and during festivals. You can easily meet military personnel. However, the fact that she didn't even know who the father was. That means you cheated. While the former wife brought misfortune, this new one attracts the worst kind of luck. What a disaster. You're the one who got carried away wanting a kid. Sarah and Megan started blaming each other again. I decided to put an end to this. Your folks did a bunch of superstitious rituals, huh? And you thought that passion and belief could go against science. I said it with a burst of laughter. Then why not pray for the child's blue eyes and blonde hair to turn black, beg the gods to alter its DNA, if you truly believe in it, Perhaps wearing black underwear could magically change the child's hair and eyes to black over time. What do you think? Just then, my phone rang. Right on cue, it was him. Yes, come on in. Who's that? Jeff and his parents looked puzzled. Footsteps approached, and the doorbell rang. A tall man stood at the door. Emily, I've come to pick you up. Thank you. Are you okay, Emily? Sorry I wasn't home yesterday. I have surgery to perform. Of course, don't worry. I introduced the man to everyone. 
This is my new husband, Kevin. Hello, everyone. What? Yes, I had remarried. I met my new partner, a military doctor, through work. He's tall, earns a good salary. And most importantly, he's incredibly kind and always puts me first. He's a real gentleman, something none of those men in the room could compare to. So, goodbye, everyone. I was cursed to live alone, but as you see, I'm not alone anymore. Kevin, smiling, remarked. Now Emily is under my care. Sarah blurted out something incomprehensible like, so the child with the blue eyes must be this guy's, right? Though, come on, don't be ridiculous. That's impossible. I've heard the story from Emily. Kevin intervened. It's okay to be superstitious if you just want to boost your chances a little, but bringing others down for the sake of superstition doesn't lead to happiness. You shouldn't use superstitions as a reason to blame someone else. And isn't it said that what goes around comes around in the United States? Up until now, Jeff, with his mouth wide open, shamelessly brought up his theory again. Then why is Smith from the next door still alive, despite being given a short time to live? I thought Smith had nothing to do with it, but... Life expectancy predictions are supposed to be shortened to allow people to prepare. No doctor will ever definitively say a patient will die within that time. Kevin explained. He then declared firmly, Emily won't be around you unhappy folks anymore, and with that, we left the house together. For a while after that, Jeff kept sending me emails, begging for financial help. According to his account, Megan eventually left his home, leaving behind the child whose parentage was uncertain. She might have gone somewhere far away after giving up on him due to his lack of money. Now, Jeff is living in a state of confusion and hopelessness with his parents, taking care of the child with blue eyes and blonde hair. Serve you right, no way I'm helping. Emily, today, I went to a special place to perform a ritual for attracting wealth and luck. It was like a magical experience, something meant for wishing prosperity. Handing me a small package when he returned from an outing with friends. Oh. Inside was a tiny ceramic clover for my wallet. A four-leaf clover for good luck. But above all, it's just so cute. Yes, it is. Cute and a bit of good luck is just enough for us. My husband picked a green clover and I put a pink one in our wallets each. We laughed together 